guys, welcome back to DeFi, DGen, Strip, and Farm for Poverty, where our mission is to empower the impoverished and help you find financial freedom through crypto assets and DeFi. <laughs> so if you like that mission, you resonate with the vision, smash that subscribe button, help us reach more people and spread the word. Drip is still super early and there's still plenty of room to grow. That's why I jumped on this uh, channel and started creating this content literally less than three weeks ago. Um, I'm late to the drip game, but I'm trying to bring you guys the best information I'm learning along the way uh, from the older investors and seeing where the new stuff is going. And this keeps coming up, so I wanted to touch on this again, but I wanted to bring a different light because right now there's a lot of economic uncertainty. There's also um, the things hope happening in the macro environment regarding uh, the war and the protests in Canada. So I literally want to just kind of dive into this and give you guys a presentation that I actually made for another event, but I'm gonna bring it to you guys here. But I wanna ask you, you may have heard that Drip is a scam or a Ponzi or MLM or things of that nature. So, um, but I wanna ask you now, which one do you think is the actual scam? Is it the Drip or is it the fiat currency? If you're not familiar, fiat currency is basically all existing forms of money. I'm gonna use that in quotes, I'm gonna explain to you guys what money actually is, but it's the all existing forms of money that we transact with. So it doesn't matter what country you're in, um, you have a fiat currency. That is the physical backed notes in your wallet or your account that you go and transact with. So which one is a scam? Your fiat currency, which in this example is US dollars or drip. And we're gonna dive into that right now and find out which actually is which. So um, if you've ever played this game Monopoly, right? Monopoly is a game in which you are basically supposed to um, get as many resources as possible and you use the in-game um, assets to collect those resources. So um, if you've never played it, the rules are pretty simple. There's a bank, and then there is a fixed amount of money in that bank. And then you get money based on actions within the game. And then that money allows you to buy or sell, um, in this case, real estate, but they're, they're just assets, right? But I'm gonna show you now how that monopoly money may be very, very similar to um, your traditional fiat currency. So what makes monopoly money valuable is the rules of the game meaning everyone sits down at the table and decides, hey, we're gonna play this game and these are the rules, this is how much money each person gets, this is how much is taken away based on these actions and it's all transparent. Everybody knows the exact same rules and it's always done the same way. Um, but what would happen if one person were allowed to uh, add additional money to that uh, game, so to speak? What if they could just add more money and to their pile without anyone else's knowledge or without that benefiting all the players. Would you still play that game? Chances are you probably wouldn't, right? So if you're playing a game Monopoly and one person has 10 extra Monopoly banks available and they just keep adding more money to their stack, you'd be like, they're cheating, they're rigging the game because that money's not being dispersed evenly. But let's first talk about what is money. So money in and of itself, the actual money definition it was a market invention that allowed us to simplify trade and barter between people so that you could actually exchange goods and services. The most important thing is that it operated as a medium exchange, but not just a medium exchange. It was meant to have more um, function than just a medium exchange. So we look at some traits of money. Some traits of money are that it is portable, it is durable, it's divisible, it's scarce, which is really important, we'll come back to, and it's fungible and it has multiple purposes. So durability means it can actually last, you know, it doesn't break down very easily. You wouldn't want to have money like salt, for example, that can, you know, water basically and wash it down. Um, so uh, portability means you can easily take it with you wherever you want. Uh, divisible means you can break it down into different the notes, like a $10 can go to a five and ones. Scarce is super important because it only has value if it's limited. If you can get infinite amounts of it, like the Monopoly game we talked about, then it starts to lose its value. Uh, fungible means that 
if I have one and you have one, they're exchangeable. Nobody cares. It's not unique in and of itself. My $5 bill is worth the same as your $5 bill. And it's the same as someone else who has five $1 bills. And then lastly, multiple purpose is super, super critical. These are traits of money. Remember, what you have in your wallet or in your bank account, what everybody uses is not money by definition. It's currency, right? What you have in your account does not serve any multiple purposes. Money is meant to have multiple purposes, meaning more than just a medium of exchange. Here's some historic examples of early forms of money. So we had um, rocks and seashells. So again, those serve multiple purposes. You could do other things with them, cook with them and break things down with them and whatnot. You had beads. Then they went to like metal um, objects that they could shape. And then um, it was before that we had trade uh, cattle and uh, trade and barter. And eventually it started moving to a more of a currency system where we were using uh, coins and tokens that were created from things. So we would take precious metals and we turn those into coins that could be traded. However, every single one of these historic um, forms of money got deflated or inflated, I should say, and then bear bore became useless because we found ways to quickly replicate or duplicate it. Like if someone was using seashells, someone else could go somewhere else and find those exact seashells and inflate the economy with them. Same thing with rocks. And even with the coins, they started clipping the edges off of the coins and, and making it less than its original weighted value. So that moved us into our current form of money, which is only currency. So fiat currency, these are all different forms across the globe. Like I said, it has no other value besides the one we all agree upon, and it has no other purpose. Whereas traditionally, fiat currency, uh, I'm sorry, money can be used in multiple other areas, such as gold is used in construction, it's used in jewelry, dentistry, medicine, and even aerospace. So that's why gold is considered sound money versus our fiat currency, which is only worth value because we say so. But who is the we that says it has value? Good question. That is our central banks. So every country has a central bank. The most important thing to remember about the central banks is they are independent of the government. They operate outside. They're really just a big bank in and of itself that's been given some level of authority from the government. They're best described as a banking cartel and they're a legal banking cartel. So a cartel's job is a combination of independent businesses and organizations organized to benefit its members. The central bank's job is to formulate the monetary policy and be a lender of last resort. What that means is they decide the, basically the value of the money that we're utilizing. And if we need more or we need to get more, they will lend it out. Question is, how do they lend it out? Great question. It came from this idea of fractional reserve banking, been around since like the 1700s. What they do with your money, you will give the bank $100. They then keep only 10% of that on hand in the bank and loan another person out the 90% of that. Then that means the next person can take it and put it into the bank and they can loan out again 90% of that. They can do this infinitely until basically $1,000 turns into $9,999 or basically 10 xing the value. And this is money made out of thin air. They can literally just take what you gave them and continue to loan it out. And they're making interest off of your debt because you're agreeing to pay back this loan to this money that never existed in the first place. <laughs> and you start to see where the problem is because what if everyone decides they want their money back well, that's where you run into what's known as a bank run. These happened in the late 1800s to 1900s where people heard the banks didn't have enough money on hand to um, facilitate withdrawals. So they run to the bank and then you look out your window and you see a bunch of people running to the bank and then you decide to run to the bank and it literally creates a self-fulfilling prophecy where people do not have the money they need or the bank doesn't have the money on hand to loan it out because it never had it to begin with. The banks create money from debt. And in one way, debt is good because that is a vehicle where the economy can continue to grow. Imagine if you're someone right now that you don't have money, but you have a great business idea. You need the money to, from the bank. So you need to use debt and create this against your, your business. And then that business can be a billion dollar business or something that creates money for the entire economy. So all debt's not bad debt. But 
in this case where there is just continual debt and there's no way to pay it off, the banks then, to avoid the uh, mass run on, on the banks for withdrawing the money, created promissory notes. So promissory notes are nothing more than a promise to pay. And this goes back again as far as the 1800s. And it basically just said, hey, take this note, make sure you pay back the loan. And if not, bad things would happen. Like now it messed up your credit and things of that nature. But back then they may have had even more um, tougher means to handle that situation. But promissory notes is pretty much what we do now in the form of credit and your credit score and lending and things of that nature. But what is the problem with having a bunch of debt or with stimulating the, the economy with lots of money? So let's just say the, the banks continue to loan out this money that never existed and then people, the money is being injected into the system. Well, the problem is that no additional uh, goods or services are being produced, yet extra money is being injected. This means that your existing goods and services must go up in cost. This is inflation. So if we have just say 100 apples and everybody agrees that 100 apples, $1 per apple, but all of a sudden now, and all there's 100 of us and we each have $1, we all can buy one apple. But what happens if somebody outside the system comes and now gives us each $10? There's only apples to buy. Well, if there's 10 extra dollars per person, the person with the apples is not going to turn around and sell them for one dollar because now there's extra money in the system to support those apples and they will be losing money if they did so that now will 10x the cost of those apples that's just a simplified version of you know to see what happens with inflation over time and here's an interesting study done by dollardays.org so they basically looked at fiat currencies over 1,000 years. So the last dec uh, 1,000 years is like 1920 or so. 775 individual currencies were looked at from different countries, different nations all over the world. All of them have failed or gone to zero. The only one that is still successful to this day is the British pound sterling, which has been in circulation since like 1880, 1890. So about 120 years or so. 130 but the average lifespan is 27 years the british pound sterling has only lost 99.5 percent of its value since its inception so this is the most successful guys the most successful fiat currency is 0.995 percent down in 130 years that is insane and the average ones die after 27 years so how did we get to where we are with the current u.s dollar system well that is a funny story in and of itself this basically happened back in 1913 when six men, six men met together to create the global monetary reserve and together they equated about one fourth of the global monetary policy. So those six men together made up one fourth of all the money in the world. And these six men decided, hey, we need a way to um, basically make a system where we can lend out money globally and that it will have a standard across the world, yada, yada, yada. And this was all in the U.S. And they created the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. And they pitched this to Congress and it got passed because the bill was written in such a way that it sounded as though the government still had power when in actuality power is in the hands of the money producers, the money printers. And that happens to be the Federal Reserve. And then we start to see where this collapsed, basically. So after World War II and right before, the U.S. was acquiring much of the world's gold reserves. So basically what was happening, the U.S. was on the sidelines and they were sending supplies and ammunition and weapons and all this stuff. And other countries were in turn giving them gold for this stuff. That's fine. It was gold, right? Gold is a sound money, as we talked about already. But what happened after that is that once the U.S. entered into the war and the war was decided, um, the U.S. had much of the gold reserves. So in 1944, 44 allied countries met together and said, hey, let's go ahead and use the dollar from the U.S. because it's already backed one to one to the gold. So instead of you trying to uh, go get slivers of gold to trade in, it's like, we'll just use this much more easier to carry U.S. dollar note. And at that time, the Federal Reserves were pegged or backed by the gold that was in the Federal Reserve from, again, all the countries that were sending it to the U.S. and the U.S. becoming the largest uh, owner of gold at that time. However, um, during 1963, uh, 
President Kennedy was assassinated. And this is a assassination theory. He was killed, nobody knows exactly why, but it was said it was because of the people that were in charge of the Federal Reserve and the, the amount of global power. Remember, this originally got created by six guys. So if you take that over the years, as this has grown, this would have been 50 years later, this large sum of money and wealth these people had, the influence, could have, we nobody knows, persuaded this assassination. And the reason being is that Kennedy was trying to create a U.S. Treasury dollar that was going to be pegged to silver. So he was trying to remove the power from the Federal Reserve and actually create a new dollar that would be pegged. So remember, the Federal Reserve was pegged to the gold, but they were able to print more if they wanted to due to fractional reserve lending. Uh, but he wanted the Treasury to have a one-to-one -one without the excess uh, printing. But he was assassinated before, he, before this could come into play, but there are still some uh, silver dollars out there that were based off of this um, uh, attempt he made. Then in 1971 is where it all goes downhill, guys. This is where the shit hit the fan. So basically, we had an economic recession. President Clinton, I'm sorry, Nixon, not Clinton, Nixon during 1971 decided to remove the gold standard from the U.S. dollar. So this means the dollar no longer was tied to anything. It just became a true fiat currency. Prior to that, it was money because it was tied to gold. But once Nixon removed the gold from the backing of the U.S. dollar, it just became this piece of paper that we all agreed, back to the monopoly thing, we all agreed that we would transact in this and that it had value. Well, from 1971 till today, here's what happens. The debt, because remember, the Federal Reserve can print money. They can make more of it. Remember, central bank's job is a lender of last resort, and they make money from debt. So they can increase by raising the debt ceiling. The debt ceiling was nothing more than something that said, we don't want to go above this. But if we say this is uh, the high and we don't want to go above, that means we can't print any more money. Well, we can just raise the ceiling so that we can print more money. Since again, we control it, we being the Federal Reserve, that's what happens. So from 1776 to 2008, we had less than $1 trillion in debt, we being the US and the Federal Reserve. From 2008 to 2012, it 13X. So in four years, 13x. 2012 to 2016, only 5 trillion additionally added. And you can't see because of my face here in the bottom, but our total right now is 30 trillion. So this down here says 30 trillion. And um, 10 trillion of that came during the economic stimulation packages for COVID. So we did 10 trillion in one year, whereas before it took us 1776, 2020, that is three 240 years 44 years to get to 20 trillion and we did in one year half of that <laughs> that is insane but you probably don't even understand or can wrap your head around i know i couldn't what a million a billion or trillion even looks like so here's a simple example if you were to take 1 million seconds 1 million seconds from right now will send you out to about um 12 days from now one billion seconds from now will be about 32 years into the future. And one trillion seconds is 32,000 years into the future. We will all be dead. You won't even be here. Remember, 10 trillion of this was created. So this would be 10x of 32,000. So 320,000 years was made in one year of seconds equivalent. If you want to use height, you got 1 million dollars stacked of 100 us notes stacked would be one meter so that'd be about the height of a chair if you go up to 1 billion this is the height of the burj khalifa in um uh, dubai so it's the tallest building in the world um, and that's one kilometer up and if you want to go to one trillion just one trillion you get up to 631 miles or one kilometer up in the air or two and a half times as high as the international space station but remember, that's one trillion. We did 10 trillion in one year. We 10 X this value in one year. That again, it's still, you can, there's not even a, a height that I could find to make that up. And the same thing with this 320,000 years. Like what the hell is 320,000 years? You can't even wrap your head around that. Like it makes no goddamn sense. But yet that's how much money just came out of nowhere. Go back to the slide we talked about with 
the, um, the goods and services, what do you think happens if you give 320,000 years worth of money in one year? What happens to the price of goods and services? Well, we can look back historically and see what's happened. <laughs> so over the course of time, from the inception of the dollar till now, it's lost 26x of its value. So it's gone down 26x. 50% of that, you can't see again on this chart here at the bottom, um, has been in the last, maybe I can move this. I think I can. Aha. All right. 50% has depreciated in just the last um, year. So we went from just over $1.20 to, I'm sorry, in the last 10 years, 10 years. So the dollar currently now, it's looking at, I think they're like 85 cents if you were to actually chart it out for 2021. But um, that is insane. So remember, we mentioned that historically, um, every single fiat currency has gone to zero. The US dollar is trending along those lines because we keep printing more of it. And here's an awesome quote that I found from someone. It says, inflation is legalized counterfeiting and counterfeiting is illegal inflation. <laughs> so counterfeiting is only illegal because it is someone else injecting money into the monetary supply that was not the authorized injector, meaning it didn't come from the central bank. But the central bank can make more of this money whenever they want, and it's the same thing. So it's still counterfeiting because it takes the value from your wallet and puts it in the, the value of the actual counterfeiters, meaning the central bank. The only people that benefit from this is the central banks because they control the monetary supply. And what they do with the money when they inflate it, they buy assets with this money. And remember, they loan it out to you and you pay interest on it. So you're actually taking imaginary money and giving them real money in return. Money, it's actually currency, but they're the only ones that benefit because we, the people, are the ones that absorb the cost of the inflation, not the central banks. So the people at the top of the food chain. So again, which of these do you think is actually a scam? Is it drip? Is it um, Bitcoin or any other of the legitimately existing cryptocurrencies? Or is it the fiat system? So you decide, but there's some interesting quotes on how, how old this has been in play and how this has been around. So this is Mark Twain. When the rich rob the poor, it's called business. When the poor fight back, it's called violence. Let that sink in for a bit. Here's another one from Henry Ford. It is well enough that people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system, for if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. And that's exactly what's happening with kind of the Bitcoin revolution. When Shatoshi Nakamoto introduced this, he wanted, he saw this happening. This was from 2008 the financial crisis and when all the banks got bailed out, if you don't remember what happened in 2008, they basically had no more money because they loaned it all out, remember fractional reserve banking, and then they could not pay out, pay back the loans and the debt that they had acquired. So what happened? The central bank had to come in and give them money. The central bank printed money again to bail out the banks that had loaned out money. So the rich got richer. These people that did not financial were not financially responsible for your money loaned it out and went bankrupt with it but since that was the global banking structure and this was the u.s um they had to bail those banks out I meaning they had to give them extra money like that was the whole thing of too big to fail like how insane is that you're so poor with money management that even when you fuck it up <laughs> someone else can give you more money to continue fucking up <laughs> that is ludicrous so if you want to know more about these things there's an awesome book called the creature from jekyll island this literally tells you about the federal reserve and how it came into play it's a 25 hour book on amazon uh audible audible if you want to listen to it um but super deep dive into how this actually got created and how um sketchy the entire system is um then another good book is when money dies um i have not read this one but i heard some clips from this and if you want to just watch a YouTube video on it, you can watch The Whole Truth and Passive Income Financial Freedom with the... No, that's not this one. Sorry, I kept playing. It should be... Um, there's something else. Another, another video that I have to leave in the description. But um, it was something about 
something when monetary policy, when money fails, something like that. But it's a documentary on money and uh, not sure which one it is just yet. But anyway, guys, uh, do your own research on this. This is the reason why we are in the situation that we're in now, why we're seeing uh, large amounts of inflation. And you have to decide what you want to do. But as of right now, the U.S. dollar is the global reserve currency. So it is still the global reserve currency. And whatever the U.S. does, does affect other markets. So even if you're not from the U.S., you're not trading in dollars, it doesn't matter. Because when goods from China come to any other country, they are um, on the budget seat placed in U.S. dollar value. And if the U.S. has one of the shittiest uh, monetary policies going on right now, and you can see they can just print money out of thin air, uh, what happens to the value of the money in your account, even in another country? You have to decide what to do with that, but um, that is why people are running to Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and stuff like that, because they're seeing this financial system. It's not gonna fail, it's gonna stick around, and there are the, again, the central banks will not allow their stronghold, their grip of power, to just fizzle out, um, not any time in the future. And you can already see what happened in Canada, where if you own a bank, they can actually uh, seize or block your account. Like if you have a bank account, even if you're trading in Bitcoin or even if you haven't done anything that they deem, that they deem it against the law, they can now block your assets. So as long as we're using that system, we're always tied to it and you're going to be crippled by it. So that is why people are moving towards other, other uh, areas. And that's why I'm looking at Drip as a hedge against all this stuff. Um, it is deflationary by nature. There's a fixed amount of Drip. Yes, the tr contract can mint more, but with the tax system in place and all the other use cases that are being provided, it is definitely uh, a means to create financial stability within the crypto system. You still gotta eventually send that out to fiat, but if fiat, I'm sorry, crypto gets adopted, then you could basically stay within crypto. So you can think of a day where um, ETH is too volatile, but say BUSD, let's just use that for example, is being traded or UST or any of the other stable coins, MIM, if you're familiar with AVAX, let's just say that becomes traded amongst the masses, then that means your drip going to BUSD, you'll be able to go into a decent stock exchange, trade drip for some other, one of those other currencies, let's even use Shiba Inu or uh, Doge, and then you'll be able to buy your um, goods, foods and services with Doge, all from your crypto wallet, which means you won't have to go into the inflationary market of, of uh, fiat currency, because um, SHIB and Doge are deflationary. I believe they actually have burning mechanics in them, and I know that there's a token um, cap that they already created, so. Um, there is hope, but uh, right now, you just gotta do your own research, figure out what to do. Um, I'm still betting on uh, Forex and his designs and the Drip community, but so far, so good. And hope you guys found this valuable. Um, trying to keep most of the content on Drip as well, but wanted to actually show uh, kind of the background of money and currency, and you may not even be aware of how all that operates within the confines of the crypto space and why there's so much uh, volatility and um, hype and legislation coming around the crypto space because you can see how this is very fearful for those that have the power and they don't want to lose that power so I'll find the actual video that I wanted to show you guys for YouTube and I'll put it in the description but until next time guys lift daily achieve your impossible if you like the video please like hit a thumbs up leave a comment help us grow this community so that we can indeed empower the impoverished thanks guys see ya